So let me go to my camera. Now I did want to do the first four problems because they really try to get you to see like the insides and the outside. So this is essentially in college algebra, y'all did composition, right? Y'all did, I think y'all saw them like this, F of G or G of F like that. And so essentially what it meant was you had the G function inside the F function or vice versa, you had an F function inside of a G function, okay? Um, now what we're doing is basically taking the derivative of things like this, okay? Um, I tried to make it a summary. <laughs> and then I was watching my summary from the video and I realized my kid's arm was in the way. Um, I don't know where's the, oh, here it is, can be with slide. My kiddo and I, my teenager and I were laughing at it. Um, and it's at the very beginning too. But in this video was where I try to basically summarize when you're using things. So if you're doing a power rule like this and the base of that exponential is not x, then you would have to apply chain rule, right? If you're doing the log and your argument is not just x, you would have to apply chain rule. Same thing with the exponential, the trig function, all the trig functions. Um, and then eventually we talk about some other ones. Now, essentially, chain rule is happening always. We just have never talked about it. Okay. But you could apply chain rule all the time and you'll still get the right answer. Okay. For instance, if we were doing the derivative of something, I think her hand already went in the way and I kind of spotted it out the way. <laughs> but <laughs> I thought that was so funny. I was like, oh my God. And I said, I didn't even skip a beat with me talking or nothing. I was just like, get out of here. Oh. <laughs> but let's say, for instance, if you were to do the derivative of x squared, right? I'm just going to have a little light here. There we go. What is the derivative of x squared? 2x. But if you were to multiply by the derivative of that base, just the base, what is the derivative of x? It's just one. So does the value change at all? It's still 2x, okay? So you could always have been applying chain rule, just didn't because it didn't change anything, okay? Versus like this problem, that one's different because now your base is not just an X. And so when I apply the chain rule, it is gonna change everything. So you would solve this like a normal problem. Pretend that's one big giant X. You would have to bring down your power. You never change the base, right? You just decrease the power by one. But the chain link happens is you have to take the derivative of this on the side, okay? So what is the derivative of x squared plus 2x? Mm -hmm. And then now you've successfully applied the chain rule. So notice here, it doesn't make no difference, but here it does, right? This expression is not the same as that expression, okay? And so you have to apply the chain rule. Usually you're applying it all the time, except when your base is just x, it doesn't really do anything if you apply it. Okay, so it's exactly the same. But if your base is not x, it will change your answer. Okay. Um, so I think for one through four, it was essentially trying to see the insides and the outside. Um, this is great and all, but to me, I think it makes things more confusing, but it's how every single book tries to explain it. So I wanted to go through one through four um, maybe I can do like a split screen here. I don't think it lets me I'll play around with this and see if I can get it to shrink a little bit. There we go. So if I go to the assignment, we'll talk about those first four problems.
So C number one essentially gives you the function and it tells you it's a composite function. So there is an inside and an outside, okay? And notice the one that's inside is the G, inside the parentheses, right? And F is on the outside of the parentheses. And we've already identified what F is. So they're saying that F is obviously something squared, okay? So here, all they're asking is what is that something that's being squared? And so in that particular problem, what is it? What is it that's being squared in this specific problem? Mm -hmm. So 8x minus 7 is your inside function. So you basically apply whatever rule goes with this guy. Oh, that's my cursor. I was like, what is that? <laughs> you apply the power rule to this, and you bring down the 2, you rewrite the u, and then you decrease the power by 1. But that base is not supposed to be the u, that base is supposed to be the inside minus 7. And then because of the chain rule, you actually have to multiply by the derivative of that 8x minus 7. So, so, mm -hmm. so you sort of replace, you, you take the derivative of a derivative of it as if that entire term is just a variable mm -hmm. and then you multiply it by the derivative. Of that right. Term. Okay. So you bring down the two, you rewrite your base, and then you decrease the exponent by one, but then you have to apply the chain rule, which means multiply by the derivative of 8x minus 7. What is the derivative of 8x minus 7? It's 8. And so what you end up with is that y prime is essentially just 16 times 8x minus 7. Okay. And so in that summary, I tried to summarize it. Like, it's just, if, if your base is not um, x, or if you have e to something that's not x, or log of something that's not x, or a fraction, like in this case, of something at the bottom that's not just x, you, you apply that chain rule always, okay? Or trick functions that are not just x. So let's submit this one and make sure that that one's good. These are kind of silly because they give you like half the answer. Um, okay, so the second one says y equals one over the square root of x plus 13. And they tell us over here with the outside function. Is this is radical expressed by a one half exponent, right? But because it's downstairs, now it's represented by a negative uh, one half exponent, right? But what is inside that negative one half exponent? Mm -hmm. X plus 13. Now, if I were to have to take the derivative of this, I would apply the power rule to something to the negative one half exponent. But then I would have to, when I'm done applying that power rule, I would have to multiply by the derivative of x plus 13. So what is the derivative of x plus 13? It's just one. So I'm gonna write this problem down and show you how I would do it if it weren't, um, if I was doing all that inside outside business. So if I wanna rewrite this, it would be, x plus 13 to the negative one half. And if I were trying to find y prime, I would bring down my one half exponent, keep my base the same, and then take away one from my exponent. So it'd become negative three halves. And then because the base is not just x, I do have to multiply by its derivative, which someone said was what, okay? Which in this case, it didn't change anything, right? Multiplying by one, isn't gonna change anything. So if you had accidentally forgot the chain rule of this problem, it wouldn't have made a difference, right? But in the previous problem, it would have because you'd be missing that eight, right? So you have to be very, very careful here. And if I really wanna rewrite this, it would be two and then x plus three to the positive three halves, x plus 13 to the positive three halves.
Let's see what number three looks like. This was all just my little stuff I was talking about at the beginning. So for number three, it has eight, 10 of you identified as the outside function. So essentially just figuring out where you is, you is after the 10, isn't it? So what is it that was after the 10? What was I taking the tangent of? Mm -hmm. So that's what they want in here, pi x to the fourth. Now, if I were to do this on paper, let me write that down. If I write this down, when I try to take the derivative, this is just the constant multiplier. So it will get multiplied by my derivative of tangent, right? What is the derivative of tangent? You can guess. It is secant squared. Mm -hmm. I'm checking to see if I had that little formula sheet, but I don't. But don't change the angle. It should be the same angle as it was before. You were doing 10 of pi x to the fourth. It needs to stay secant squared of pi x to the fourth. Where the pi x to the fourth comes in play is the chain rule. Because I'm, my angle is not just x all by itself, right? It's this whole thing. So what is the derivative of pi x to the fourth? It's a little weird because of the pi. It's four pi x to the third. You bring down the four, right? Pi is just a constant multiplier. It looks like a letter, but it's not, right? So it's four, bring down the four, and then decrease your power by one. So that's four pi and then x to the power three. So all together, these two things multiplied together would actually be 32 pi x cubed and then the secant squared pi x to the fourth. So anytime your base or your angle or your argument is not just an x, you have to apply the little chain rule. There's a problem in here though that has a double chain rule. I think there's like two of them I picked. Um, and we're gonna talk about those. Now number four, let's see number four. So they're saying some, the outside function is something raised to the power seven. So what over here was being raised to the power seven? Mm -hmm. And so it's all they want you to type in there is just natural log of x. And that's it. I didn't check any of these, but should have. Okay. So we kind of already done, when I did number one, I kind of already gave you an example for a problem like that. I think I also did those in the, in the lecture, but let me do this one, number four y equals ln of x to the seventh. So if they were to have asked me for the derivative of this, they didn't, but if they had, there's a power, right? So I have to apply the power rule. So you bring down the seven, you keep the base exactly the same as it was and decrease the power by one. But since the base was not x, I have to multiply by the derivative of that base. What is the derivative of ln of x? What is it? Not x. It has an x. The derivative of just ln of x. Say it again. It's not ln of x itself. Say it again. No, one over x, there you go, is one over x, okay? The derivative of ln of x is one over x. 
So if I were to put this together, it would be seven ln of x to the sixth power over x. Okay. The number 10 doesn't ask me for the inner and outer stuff. So we're just gonna go at it, okay? So if I wanted to find f prime of t, this has a power. I'm gonna apply the power rule. So you bring down the power, you keep the base exactly as it was, decrease the power by one. Here's the weird part. You have to multiply by the derivative of that base. And this is where it's gonna get weird because it depends on how you do that, right? If you wanna do quotient, go for it. If you do something else, you might have to do it on the side. Because I know there's like at least two people in here that do not do the quotient rule with this, just because I've seen you work. Um, if they were to try to take the derivative of that, they would actually rewrite it as this, so the power negative one. And then they would take the power, the derivative of that. Okay. But notice that the derivative of this also requires chain rule. So if I wanted to do the derivative, I would bring down my power, keep the base the same, decrease the power by one, and then multiply by the derivative of t minus nine. What is the derivative? Yes, it's one. So it really doesn't change anything, does it? You get negative one times t minus nine to the power negative two. And that is the derivative. So that's what would be going here. Okay. So you could do that off to the side. If you didn't do that off to the side, you would have to do quotient rule all up in here because you can't rewrite this and not take the derivative when you already have f prime up here. Okay. Because when you have f prime here, it means you're already doing the derivative. So when you do this thing, you can't just write this right there. That's not the derivative of it, right? That's just the base line of it. So you're writing it in a different way before you take the derivative. So you could have done chain rule too. Um, I'll put my little fingers up here. But if you have one over e to the minus nine, chain square, bring down the power, decrease the power by one, and then you know you need to add the chain. So you could do low, d high, minus high, d low, over low square. What's the derivative of the top? It is zero. Mm -hmm. What's the derivative of the bottom? One. And so then you get t minus nine minus one over t minus nine squared. No, you don't get t minus nine. What happens here? Uh -huh, zero. So you don't get this guy at all. Is this the same as what I have over there? Is this fraction the same as this derivative? So negative one over t minus nine squared. It is, right? It's just with the bottom written as a, uh -huh, a negative exponent here on the paper, right? So they are the same. So you could choose how to do that derivative but chances are you should probably do that weird derivative on the side, okay? Not in the problem. It'll get really weird. Why? Because you're putting positive exponents? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Right, if you, yes, because people are trying to do the quotient rule assignment without doing quotient rule. And there's a lot of those problems require chain rule. So then yeah, you would get the wrong answer if you weren't doing quotient rule. Okay, how do I clean this up though? <laughs> so the first thing I would do is I don't need to write that one. And the second thing I would do is if I had done it this way, I would put this back in its fraction form. Whereas if I had done the quotient rule, it would already be in its fraction form. Okay. 
That's just me personally, I would have done that. And then I just would have done top times top and bottom times bottom. So what's two times one times negative one? Mm -hmm. And then what about t minus nine times t minus nine squared? On the test, it will say simplify as much as possible. Now, that means that this would be an acceptable answer, or even this would be an acceptable answer, and it's not necessarily in a fraction, okay? So both of those would be perfectly fine. But to leave it like this, this would not be simplified, right? I'm pretty sure WebAssign still accepts this. You just put it all in there, it takes it. But on the test, you do have to simplify it. The key rule when they say simplify it is if there are fractions involved, get it to one fraction, not multiple terms with fractions, all one giant fraction, and then try to reduce it as much as you can. Usually that requires factoring. Because we are going to get into some weird ones later. <laughs> They're just going to keep piling up all these strategies. So. Let me go to the next one. I had this one I saw as number 11. So how would we do a problem like this one? without individually squaring each piece. So don't square T cubed and then square the denominator. You just leave it the way it is. What kind of expression is it? Is it something squared or something squared? Is it something with a power, something where you're doing log exponentials? What's closer to 13? This one? Yeah, oh. Number 11. number 11 has a, uh, a, a square and then a square root. Oh, yes, yes. This is like number three. Thank you. So I had my number problem wrong. And it changed my numbers, different numbers on the computer than I do on my paper. But you're right. This one is more like number 13, not like number 11. I skipped over the ones that are in the videos. So like I didn't go over an example for five, six, seven, eight, or nine, because there's examples in the video that cover those kinds of concepts. And then I didn't go over 11 and 12, because those also, either they're exactly like the ones in the videos, or you should be able to watch that example and then do the next one, okay? But this one I didn't see, so I wanted to make sure we talk about it, okay? So it does have something with the power, right? As soon as you see something with the power, apply the power rule, okay? And then the chain part will happen later. So when I see something squared, I have to start the power rule, which is to bring down the square and then decrease that exponent by one, right? When you were doing this, the derivative of this, you tell me that it's just two X, right? Really, there's an invisible one here. Did you ever change the base when you were doing that derivative of x squared? You never changed the base. The base was x, and then when you did the derivative, it was still x, right? So when you apply the power rule to these things, don't change that base, okay? You just do the exact same thing as before. Bring the power down, decrease the power by one. That's it, nothing else changes. But because what had a power, is not just t in this case, you have to apply the chain, okay? So when I apply the chain, I'm taking the derivative of this. And I'd rather do just the quotient rule because it already has it in the nice little fraction form. So I'm gonna do low d high minus high d low over low squared. So low, the first part, and then d high. What is 
the derivative of this squared. Mm -hmm. And then minus pi, but then d low. So what's the derivative of the bottom part? Eight, eight to the seventh. And then this guy? Right. And it's over here. Good. And so there, I do have to do a little bit of distributing. So I might as well clean this one up and not write the little one. But over here, if I distribute 3t squared, it's like a right-hand distribution, right? So normally when we distribute, we like the numbers over here, but it's okay if they're in the back, they still distribute. So this becomes 3t, you add the exponents, 10, and then 15t squared. And I can even multiply these two together. And I get 8t. What do I get when I add those exponents? Ten again, which is coincidence, but yay, because that means I can combine like terms, right? So I'm going to write this as one big fraction. Easier part to determine is the denominator. What will the denominator be if I multiply this denominator times that denominator? It'll be t to the eighth plus five, the whole thing cubed, because there's three of those factors now down there, right? On the top, I'm going to multiply these two, and then I'm just going to combine the like terms in the parentheses. I'm not going to distribute yet. Okay. So if I multiply those two together, I get t cubed, and that result it needs to be multiplied by this. But if I combine my like terms, I'm going to have 15 t squared, and then a minus 5 t to the 10. Now here. I can look at this and know that this is not going to be this distribution. It just won't. One is because these are both the same size, it's prime size, right? So even if I factored like the common size or the t squared out, there I would get t to the eighth and a constant up here. But these are not the same size, are they? So when I factor all that stuff out, it's still not going to match with one of these guys, okay? So you could try to factor that more, but this is a simplified, I mean, it could look prettier, but it's not gonna simplify anymore, okay? So I could factor out that five, two T cubed times five T squared, and then I would just have three minus T to the eighth, but see how that does not match with the bottom at all? This factor does not match with this factor. So you can just cancel them. And that's what I mean when I say reduce, like see if something can cancel. Okay. So this would have been totally fine as the final answer. I'll leave that one there and I want you to try this one. I don't think it's number 12 because that other one was not number 11. Yeah, it's number 14. But try it. You could try it with your numbers if you want, whatever numbers you got on your assigned. Or you could try it with the numbers that I have here. But I want to see you try it and then we'll talk about it. At least the derivative part. We'll talk about the simplifying part later, but at least try to do the power rule in the same way. You can do that. Okay, not so we're off.
Okay, so most of you have got the derivative part good, but I wanted to also discuss how it simplifies because this one does simplify. Okay, so most of you did this part, which is perfectly good. So you brought down the power. You had your base the same. And then when you decrease that power by one, what is the new exponent? Negative three. And then you did your quotient rule over here on the side, or you did it like all the way off to the side, and you just needed to place the response right here next to it as a factor, right? That's the chain link, okay? Um, for me, I haven't done it, so I'm gonna do it here. So I'm gonna do low d high, the derivative of this would be 10x minus nothing, minus high the low, and the derivative of the bottom is just four plus zero over low squared, right? Now, what I'm gonna do with this negative exponent is I'm actually going to give it to both the numerator and the denominator. So this is gonna be five X squared minus four cubed. Actually, it's a negative cube. And four X plus five with the negative cube. So they both have that negative cube applied. 
Go ahead, say the word. What do you do? Exactly, they are gonna flip. Mm -hmm. Okay, I scribbled all over here because I have to. <laughs> so 10x times 4x is 40x squared. 10x times 5 is 50x. Here, though, I want to visualize this 4 in the front. So I wrote it in pink in the front because it's actually not a positive 4 that I have to distribute, right? Because of that minus, it's actually a negative 4 that I have to distribute. So when I distribute the negative 4, that's going to give me negative 20x squared and then positive 16. Now, I can combine my like terms, but just like Tristan said, these have negative exponents. Remember what negative exponents do? They flip it over the fraction bar, right? If it was downstairs and you want to put it up, it goes negative. If it was already negative and you want it to be positive, you put it back to the bottom, right? So this negative exponent is going to cause that factor to move to the bottom. And this negative exponent is going to cause this factor to move up to the numerator. And once they've done that movement, they're no longer negative exponents. Okay. My quotient rule, because I didn't do it off to the side, still not finished. So let me just combine my like terms real quick. Had I done this off to the side, I probably would have just been dragging down the response throughout. Okay, now I might try to factor that numerator. Maybe not, I'm not sure. No, because look, it's a plus and a plus, right? If it's a plus and a plus, that means both of my factors would have to be positive. Or no, both of my factors would have to be the same, right? Because they got to multiply to give me 16. So they would either both be a positive times a positive or a negative times a negative. But then this one's positive. So it definitely can't be two negatives because when I combine two negatives, you get a negative, right? When you combine, not multiply. So that means that both of my factors would have to be plus, okay? And if both of my factors are plus, I'm not going to get a factor with a minus in the middle to be able to reduce this guy, okay? So this guy's not going to get reduced. But do you see anything that can get reduced? The 4x plus 5s, you have two of them down here and three of them up there. So these two will wipe out two of those, leaving you with just one. Okay. So in the numerator, I would eventually end up with negative 2 times 4x plus 5, just one of them, times 20x squared plus 50x plus 16. And the bottom, this is not down there anymore. So it's just the 5x squared minus 4. Parentheses T, right? Oh, I forgot. There we go. So remember, if I try to factor that, this is not the same as this. These are not going to factor. And I know that even if I try to factor that, I have plus and plus, not a minus in the middle. Okay? So this, even if I try to factor it, it's not. I just don't want to do extra work because I don't have to. So you're gonna so for the test whenever we're writing now, you're going to want us to do this. Yeah. Right. It's always gonna say find the derivative and simplify. Okay. And then also there, I think on this one there's choices. So you're gonna want your fraction or whatever it is to look like one of the ones that are on the choices. Okay. That gauge actually thinks the uh, the Oh, it'll take this. As soon as you do a derivative, yeah. it'll even take that, yeah. As long as you did the derivative part and you put the chain there, it'll take it. It does not make you simplify. But there's gonna, the whole reason why I'm making you simplify, you're like, we just wanna make this jump for two extra words. <laughs> the whole reason why I'm doing that is because in chapter four, you have to find what are called critical numbers. Now you remember those questions that we've been asking you in a couple of the sections that say, where's the horizontal tangent, right? They're saying it that way right now, but eventually they're gonna call those X values that you find critical numbers, okay? And critical numbers are not only found by taking the derivative and equaling it to zero, 
but they're also found by finding where the derivative is undefined. So in order for me to do that successfully in chapter four, I have to have one giant fraction and me finding the critical numbers essentially boils down to taking the numerator and equaling it to zero and then taking the denominator and equaling it to zero. Because the numerator equals to zero tells me where the horizontal tangent lines are, but the denominator equals to zero tells me where the critical, the critical values where the derivative is undefined. Okay, the bottom equal to zero. That tells you where it's undefined. So that's why I want you to practice. Because if you get your practice down now, then when you get to chapter four, it's not even a big deal to take the numerator equals zero to the denominator. We do have to get one big fraction. I had one guy, was, he was an online guy, wasn't the guy in this class. He's like, this just is too long, it's too much. And I'm like, well, don't take how to. <laughs> Those probably take pages to do, not just half a page, but pages to complete. They're crazy. Okay, this was the double. The double um, tangle. Okay. There was one in the review, but I wanted to do a different one. Um, not in the review, but in the lectures. So the weird thing about this is you do see a power, right? So for me, I see the power. I automatically want to do the power rule. And there's and that's totally okay. You need to. Okay. So I would have this constant multiplier eight. And then if I apply the power rule to this. It means bring down the power and then decrease the power by one, right? But we already know that we're not supposed to change this base at all. Okay, you don't change it. What you do is it causes a chain, right? So you multiply by its derivative. What is the derivative of sine? Cosine. And whatever that angle is, it stays exactly the same. However, we also know that chain rule applies when the angle is not just the variable all by itself. I don't have just T right here, so I have to apply another chain rule. What's the derivative of pi T? Just pi. So it had a double one. So not only was my base not just the T, but then my angle was not just the T. And so I had to do the chain link twice. Okay, that was very, very tricky. It's usually the trig function that will have a, a double chain. And you'll know if this is not T and then if your base is not T. That's two, two chains. So if I simplify this, I'm basically just going to multiply all the little monomials together, and the trig functions are just going to stay put. So it'll be 64 pi. You could write sine to the seventh power pi t, and then cosine pi t. So this one was really weird because I had that double, double chain. I have a few more, there's like a few more. So we're gonna still keep practicing. But I noticed one in there, like number 22. There was another one with the radical, but I think I did an example like that in the video. Um, one of the videos. But for this one, number 22. Okay. What is going on in here? So you have a function with x times another function that has an x. So then that requires which rule? Product rule. Product rules always supersede any of your exponent rules, right? Didn't they when you were doing them with regular stuff, not 
chain rule stuff, right? If you solve something with X times something else with X, you immediately do product rule, right? So we have to apply the product rule. This is where I always try to write the game plan first, and then I'll actually do the derivatives because it helps you to map out what's going on before you actually do it, okay? So if I wanted to find Y prime, it's basically the first um, factor here times the derivative of the second factor plus the second factor times the derivative of the first factor. So notice I didn't actually take the derivatives of the pieces yet, did I? All I did was just tell you I needed to. And then we'll write down what those actual derivatives are. Mm -hmm. You have to. It's whatever applies. Okay, what is the derivative of this little one, x squared? So that one's the easy one, right? This other one is the one that is going to require the chain. Because I know that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, right? It's the same exact thing. So, right, exactly. So I know that when I do the derivative of e to the exponential, it's going to be the exact same thing. But because that exponent was not just an x, that's where the chain rule applies. So what is the derivative of the negative nine x? Negative nine. It's not minus nine, so I definitely try to use those parentheses, okay? It's just multiplied by negative nine. So when I simplify the first term, it's gonna be negative nine x squared e to the negative nine x. And when I simplify the second term, it's just gonna be two x e to the negative nine x. Now this is perfectly okay. It's not gonna simplify anymore. These guys are not like terms. I know they almost look like like terms, right? They have this guy the same, and they even have x the same. But are the exponents the same on the x? No. You cannot put them together. If these were both x squared or if they were both regular x, then you could put them together. Okay? But right now you cannot. They're not the like terms. However, if that's not one of my answer choices, I might need to manipulate it. So just to go over how you could do that, you could factor out what they have in common. They have an x in common and they have an e to the nine, negative 9x nine in common. That would leave me with negative 9x plus 2. I could even go further and write 2 minus 9x, right? And if that still doesn't match my choices, maybe this would match my choices. That negative exponent. Um, but any one of these, they're all the same thing, right? But on a test, you have options. <laughs> and you've got to find the one that is the, that's equivalent to what you found. Okay. But I just wanted to kind of talk about the different ways that that answer might look. Okay. And this is where partial credit is going to come into play too. Because the whole point is I have to have you answer the test. That is like the way I know that you answered the question, like within the amount of time if you're doing it online or if you're doing it in your own class. But for these problems, I might just choose to take them for the same thing. And you get the choices if you take it on the computer. If you take it in class, you don't get the choices. Okay. Like if you were if I were to make a paper exam, there's no choices. So you have to do something and then just select an option, the one that matches yours. But if for some reason what you have on paper is correct, just somewhere you're in theory maybe, you still should be able to get the majority of those points, okay? Based on how I do my derivative. Okay. So I want to know if you know how to do the derivative. Yeah, so it would be great if you could write it as a fraction. Why? Because chapter four, you're gonna have to take the numerator equal to zero and the denominator equal to zero. 
So this is always the goal. But as long as you're doing the derivative spread, you still worry about that in chapter four. Okay. But you do eventually want to get one fraction. Unless it just has no fractions at all. Now, 23, this one's weird. I love when they have L and a B. It happened on the test. There was a problem, I cannot remember. It was like one over X, L and, L and of X squared, something like this. Like that. And most of you let you, oh, I'm thinking of the wrong class. That's a Cal 2 question. <laughs> Sorry. So this is going to take us way back. How many of you remember your log properties? Sort of. Okay. Here's one. If you have log, and it doesn't matter whether it's log or ln, okay, but if you have log with any base, this is like base E, right? Um, if you have log of any base and you're multiplying two things together, the rule says it's the same thing as adding the two individual logs together, okay? You have another one that says if you're dividing two values in your argument, you basically are taking the log of the numerator minus the log of the denominator. And there's one more that's going to play here. If you have x to an exponent, that exponent can essentially just come down as a coefficient. Okay. So it doesn't matter what the log base is. Remember that ln, by definition, is the same thing as log base e, right? So you can apply those rules. So if I take this exponent and I bring it to the front, it's gonna be eight X log base E of E. Does anybody know what, again, this is the same thing as saying natural log. What is the natural log of E? Eight it is one, right? If I do ln of E, it wants a power. If I just want E, it's gonna be a one power. And you do, you just get one, okay? So this right here is just one, which means I have eight X times one, which is just eight X. So really there's not anything crazy happening here. What's the derivative of eight X? It's just eight. Okay. Now, I could have also done it with chain rule. It just would have had a double chain, and I still would have got the answer eight. I feel like using the log property is much easier, but we'll go over it without doing that. So, if I wanted to find y prime without using the log property, I see this natural log here. How do you take the derivative of a natural log? What's the derivative of ln of x? Somebody told me earlier. Other way around. It'd be one over x, okay? So the derivative of ln of an argument is one over that argument, okay? But because my argument is not just x, it's e to the x, the x, okay? This is not just x, which means I'll have to have a chain of okay? So yes, the derivative of ln is one over the argument. But then I have to multiply by the derivative of that argument. What is the derivative of e to the eight x? For exponentials, it's the exact same thing, right? But because the exponent is not just an x, I have to multiply by the derivative of that exponent. What is the derivative of eight x? Eight. What happens to this E and that E? They cancel. And so all I have left is one times eight, which is eight. 
do get the same exact thing, but it requires two chain links, right? Let me move this little green thing out of the way. Okay, so you can do it chain rule or using log properties as well. I just think the log properties are easier. So both of those should give you P as your derivative. Okay, here's that tangent line problem. I knew there was one in here because they're like in every assignment. They're trying to warm you up to chapter four. Okay, so number 24 looks something like this. Yours might have a different function, but it still should be something similar. And it says, determine the points at which the tangent or the graph of this function have horizontal tangent. Okay. So we know that horizontal lines, or if you're talking about the tangent line, you're talking about a horizontal tangent line. Well, that means that the slope of the tangent line, tangent line is flat. So the slope of the tangent line is what? Zero. And so if we want to find in tan, slope of the tangent line, that's F prime. We just need to figure out how would I make it zero, okay? So this part means M10 equals zero. And I know that M10 is the same thing as F prime. And that's how you find it, right? So essentially what I wanna do is set F prime equal to zero and solve for F. And then once I know what X is, how do you figure out what Y is? Right, this is a fancy way of saying Y, right? So you just plug your X in there and you'll get your Y. This hard part or the new part is the derivative. This is what kind of function? It's a fraction right now, right? We cannot do it with radicals. I know that much, we cannot do it with radicals. So the first thing you wanna do is rewrite that radical into a one half exponent. From here is your choice. And it, it is not wrong to do either of them. From here, you can do it like a fraction and apply quotient rule, or you can write that as a negative exponent and then do it as a product rule, okay? It's up to you however you wanna do it. Understand, that I am now, this is like a chapter four topic. They just keep trying to squeeze it in under the section in chapter three <laughs> as you go. But it is a chapter four thing. So I'm letting you know right now, you have to get one giant fraction before you set that numerator equal to zero, okay? So, because when you have a fraction, your numerator over your denominator and you set it equal to zero, what's the first thing you do to get rid of the fraction? Multiply by the denominator. And then what happens when you multiply by that denominator? It cancels over here. And what's zero times any denominator? So really you just want the numerator equal to zero, right? So I do need to figure out what that numerator is gonna look like. Me personally, if I use quotient rule, it's already in fractions, right? <laughs> I don't gotta do with all the negative exponents and then put the negative exponents back into fraction forms. I don't have to do all that conversion, okay? So for me personally, if it's a fraction, I will apply quotient rule, okay? If I don't have to find tangent lines or slopes or nothing like that, then I'll do the product rule. But when I have to find these numbers, I'm going to do quotient rule. So for a first derivative, it's going to be low D high, and I'm not gonna do it yet because it's gonna get complicated in a minute. So I'm just telling you, I'm gonna multiply by the derivative of the top, minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. All over the bottom squared.
Now the first term is not so bad. 2x minus 1, 1 half. What's the derivative of negative 8x? It's negative 8. And then here I'm going to go ahead and combine those double negatives and write positive 8x. But what is the derivative of this? 2x minus 1 to the power of 1 half. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, do you see that? What you did? So, if you go to the derivative of this thing, it requires a power rule, right? We bring the one half to the front, which is what he did there. We keep the base the same. And what's one half minus one? That's negative one half. But because my base wasn't just x, you had to multiply by the derivative of that base. And the derivative of 2x is 2, derivative of 1 is nothing, so it's just 2 all by itself. Okay. Now at the bottom, though, what do you get when you multiply these exponents? This one. So do I have to write an exponent there? This one? I don't have to, right? We can make it invisible for now. But it is there because one half times two is one. And I probably want to clean this up a little bit. So I have negative eight, two x minus one to the one half. Plus, what's going to happen with these two guys? What's one half of two? Isn't that two essentially going to cancel with that two? Or quote unquote reduce? Right? So all I have is 8x times 2x minus 1 to the negative 1 half over 2x minus 1. This time I do have to simplify because I have 2x minus 1 and 2x minus 1 in the top on both terms, right? So I'm pretty sure this thing is going to reduce by some factor of 2x minus 1. I just don't know if it's going to reduce by 2x minus 1 to the 1 half, what it's going to factor out to. This is the hardest part. All these radical problems are the hardest ones in calculus because y'all are not used to factoring out negative exponents. When you factor, you always have to factor out the guy with the smallest exponent. Right? You always factor out the guy with the smallest exponent because the other guy didn't have any more than that, right? So, for example, if I had 3x to the 7 plus 5x to the 2, how many could I factor out? I can only factor out x3 because this guy doesn't have, this guy doesn't have any more than x3, does he? Okay? You always go with the smaller exponent. Factoring. It's where it's weird. Between one half, and the negative one half is the top. The negative is the smallest. I also have an eight in common, don't I? So I'm gonna factor out the eight and the two x minus one to the negative one half. Now, before I write my results in there, and I'm definitely gonna need more room, so I'm gonna erase it. I'll do it on the other side. Okay, when you factor this out, right, I'm just going to be weird and put a six here so it kind of looks like what I'm doing. Now they have a six x cubed in common, right? So the six is going to come out, and what's going to end up going here? X to the fourth. And what's going to end up going here? One. Okay. How did you get this x here? You took what you had minus what you're taking out, right? And that gave you the new exponent. So what's going to happen when I do one half, take away what I'm taking out? So think about that. One half, take away a negative one half. It's going to be positive one, right? Because the double take away and the negative will turn to a plus, right? So it'll be one half plus one half. 
but you're right, it's one. So this one will become a one exponent. And here I took it out, didn't I? I took out this exactly and the eight. So I'm only left with just the X. And I took this out exactly. So the only thing I have left here is this side of the diet. And then I don't need to write this, right? I don't need to write the one. And if I don't need to write an exponent out here, is there really any purpose in having these parentheses? Parentheses are only there if you have an exponent or a coefficient. Okay. And since this does not have a coefficient and it technically doesn't have a visible exponent, you don't need those parentheses. Sure. Oh, you're right. Tap into it. Where should that negative go? Yes. Right. So then in this parentheses over here in the brackets, actually, I'm actually going to have a negative 2x, positive 1, and then positive x. So what are we going to get in that parentheses then after I combine my like terms? negative x plus one. Okay. Do you see what I did at the bottom? This guy had a negative exponent, didn't he? So he's supposed to be at the bottom. Okay. So I moved him down to the bottom. Now it's positive when I moved it. Can I put those two together? What do you do with the exponents when you put those two together? Just multiply them. If I have x to the one half times x squared, what are you doing with those exponents? You should be adding them. And so in this case, I would be a five half. But in that case, what do I get? What's one half plus the invisible one? Three halves. So when it comes to setting my numerator equal to zero, I really only am worried about setting this thing equal to zero. And it's already factored. So can eight ever equal zero? Can this factor ever equal zero? No. So you don't get a solution from over there, from that factor. Oh, okay. I mean, you follow the procedure. Zero factor factors that if you have uh, uh, factors here, you should set each factor equal to zero to get all the information. Okay? But if I set this factor equal to zero, it just doesn't give me that. Okay? You set the other one equal to zero, and what x value will you find? x equal to what? Positive one. And this is the guy that they wanted. However, if I wanted y, we have to plug in one into your function. And this was my original function. So two times one is two minus one is one. What's the square root of one? One. And so I get negative eight. So the point is going to be one for x and then negative eight for y. OK, but it was a lot of work. Um, this is like a third of a problem in chapter four. All of this is one third of the whole problem in chapter four. Okay. I told you they're going to get progressively more and more and more and more and more. Okay. And that's just the way math works. You learn a little bit and then you take that and you do the next thing. And you take both of those and you do the next thing and you take all of that and you do the next thing. It just compiles compiles and compiles.
Okay. I had another problem on here, but I erased it. It was I think number 25. Let me go see what number 25 looks like. So this one, I know you know how to do the derivative of that. Once you find the derivative, what do you do if you're trying to find the slope of the tangent line? Right, no, if you're trying to find the horizontal tangent, you said it equals zero. But if this is not a horizontal, is it? No. So you're not setting it equals zero. You just need to plug in the x value, right? right? So once you find that derivative, plug in the zero, and that'll give you your answer in there. They just want a number. Okay. Same thing here. Once you find that derivative, I would actually bring that seven to the front and then just do the derivative of ln of x instead of doing chain rule. But once you're done with all that, plug in one and then give them the answer. Okay. Um, this one, that's a baby one compared to the other one that we did. It only has one chain, right? Times the derivative, six x. This one had two chains. No, this one only has one chain. That one only has one chain. This is the one with two chains. That one you could do. This one we kind of did. That one we kind of did. That one we kind of did. Here we go, that one. F of x equal to one over 15 x minus seven. This one's asking me for what though? Second derivative. So I have to do it twice right you have to take the derivative once see what you get and then go and take the derivative of that right so it's a little bit lengthy it doesn't have radicals so it's not so bad <laughs> the radical ones are the ones that i'm like uh as soon as i see a radical i'm not happy <laughs> so for this one you can choose right is this one thing and i gotta do two derivatives i'm never gonna have to set anybody equal to zero so it doesn't matter about my question twice or anything um, if I have to do this one, would it be easier for you to do quotient rule or was it easier for you to do turn that to an exponent of negative one? Yeah, it's not bad at all, actually. Yeah, you could do quotient. I just stick with quotient. Some people don't like to do it, but I don't understand why. Um, it's not so bad. So I'm going to do low d high minus pi low all over low squared. So I did low, I did the bottom part, d high, and the derivative of the top. What's the derivative of one? Any constant, right, is zero. And then minus pi, so the numerator, just like it was, times d low. So what's the derivative of 15x minus 7? 15. So yeah, that is nice because isn't this all just one big fat zero, right? So you get that f prime is essentially negative 15 over this. And then this is where the chain rule stuff comes into play because what's gonna happen when I try to do below? I'm gonna have to apply chain rule, right? Because you got something else besides x to the power of two. So I'm going to do my double prime. So I'm going to do low d high minus high d low. I'm going to leave that alone over low squared. I already had a square, but that needs to get split, right? So this one's not too bad. What's the derivative of the top? Zero, which is nice. What's the derivative of the bottom of this? Two times 15x minus seven. Uh huh. Times the derivative of that, the chain link, right? Times 15. Gotcha. This space was not the x, it was the bottom.
Okay, well, the same thing's gonna happen to me in the front. All that's gonna go away. And this one's a little bit tricky in the numerator. You've got a negative times a negative, which is positive, right? And if I do all the monomials together, what's 15 times two times 15? Oh no, it's four fifty. What was I think? Oh, it's two twenty five, not six twenty five. That's twenty five squared. Okay, so we got four fifty. And then what about the bottom? What's that exponent going to be? Four. So you have exponent raised to an exponent, you multiply this. Right? So it'll be to the fourth power. Is anything going to simplify here, though? You've got one of these guys in the front, right? And you've got one of you got four of them in the bottom. One of them cancel with one of the fours. So this guy will wipe out one of these, leaving you with two. So you'll get 450 over 15x minus 7 cubed. That one's the second derivative. So like I mentioned in the video here, I have it paused. I'm going to try to find a spot where I you can see all of it without my hands in the way. That's kind of good. Um, these are all the rules. That all of those rules had to do, right? And they all had you because they knew came rule was coming, right? Never did they have x. We were using them to apply for x, right? But really, you always see this little new prime over there because that's the same part. You have to take the derivative of this angle. You have to take the derivative of that exponent. You have to take the derivative of that argument. And here you have to take the derivative of that thing. Okay? So all of those rules automatically had chain rule. You don't need a new set of rules <laughs> for those problems. I think I have 26. Yes. This will be the last one we do. Um, it says find the second derivative. So I have my function. It's a little bit different. It's a different trig function, but it still has like a monomial on the inside like the other one. And if I were to find the first derivative, what is the derivative of cosine? Negative sine, good. So it's negative sine and the angle does not change, right? On that rule, really you wanna put them side by side. Um, how do you get rid of all this junk on the side? I don't know how to get rid of that. But anyway. Here it says variable of cosine is negative sine, but notice that the angle does not change. Okay? It's the same exact angle. So when I write it, I have to use that same 7x squared. But I have to multiply by the derivative of that little angle. So what is the derivative of that 7x squared? 14x with the one power. Exactly. And I can rewrite it 14x sine. 7x squared. Is that good so far? I'm going to make it big again. Yeah. Now, because I'm looking at that and I need to find my second derivative, don't you have something with x and something else with x? Now, the 
and then you have to, you don't have a choice. You have to do product rule. So for the double prime, it's going to be, I have to do this. I'm just visual, sorry. <laughs> I have to like separate the first one and the second one. So when I do the product rule, it's going to be the first function times the derivative of the second one plus the second function times the derivative of the first function. And I'm actually going to put this in this bracket because it's this whole thing times whatever that derivative is. Now, I did the first one, but I have to do the derivative of this. So remember, you do the derivative of sine, but then you have to multiply by the derivative of that, right? According to the rule. So what's the derivative of sine? Cosine. But I keep my angle the same. And then I have to multiply by the derivative of this angle, which is what? 14x. Now be careful. This has to do with um, not understanding things, okay? But I will have people that will put these two and multiply the two things together and the angle will change. You cannot do that, okay? This is not part of the angle. This is just part of a product. So it's this thing times this whole thing, okay? It's not this times the angle, okay? So you cannot put the 14x in the next one. You can make put the 14x together. Okay. Um, all you can do is just basically write it like this. And that's like all you can do with that. I mean, I'll do some more in a minute, but. You cannot put the 14x in the next one. Okay. Um, which is why it's a decrease because it's like you're working with the same thing. So I did the second term, just as it was. What's the derivative of that first term? Just negative 14. The derivative of this guy is just negative 14. And if I multiply those, again, I cannot multiply the angles. It's just going to be positive times a negative 14 sine of 7x squared. And the only thing I could do is just multiply those coefficients together. I think it's 196, but I'm not sure. Yeah, negative 196. Is this right? Not right. Negative fourteen. I'm negative fourteen. Numbers are not wrong, but there is something wrong. There in the left. I just x times x equals zero. Okay, now <laughs> you don't need to mess with that anymore to leave it alone. Okay. Um, the computer will probably even take this. I don't think they'll take this because it might get confused as to whether or not this factor is good that. But normally because it's not a differential, it's really not. It's us as people that usually make that confusion. Okay. But that was a good one. So yours might be not cosine, it might be sine, but just keep that those rules in mind. Okay. Um, let me see. I'm gonna turn off the screen so I can see who's gone through the homework because I know a lot of you are working on it, but I think there's a few people already done. So those few people that are already done, you guys are free to go. Everyone else just keep working on your 3.4. Um either until we run out of class time or until you finish. As soon as you finish, you're free to go as well, okay? And don't be shy to ask questions. I still have a couple of people that don't ever ask me anything. <laughs> so don't be shy.
I have to go over and bother you. Give me one second. I'm going to check to see who's who's finished, and then I will be right there. Come on, little mouse. There you go. Okay, close the video. Or you just close the whole thing. Okay, so they say something is being shared, but you have to hear what is that mean. So what is it that you share? Okay. 
Another easy and then we go. And all my things that I have one But again, we think that there was Thank you. 